This Money Wise podcast is underwritten in part by InspireInsight.com. Do your investments reinforce your biblical values or contradict them? Don't be unaware. Visit InspireInsight.com to instantly screen your stocks, mutual funds, and ETFs for alignment with your biblical values and to find God-glorifying replacements with strong performance potential. Best of all, it's free at InspireInsight.com. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. I am Rob West. Well, you're no doubt familiar with that passage in Luke 2, given by angels to shepherds in Bethlehem. But there's an interesting backstory. Today, I'll talk with Jerry Boyer about the economics of the Christmas story. Then it's on to your calls at 800 525 7000. That's 800 525 7000. This is Money Wise, biblical wisdom for your financial journey. Well, economist Jerry Boyer joins us today. He's a columnist at the Christian Post and author of The Maker Versus the Takers, What Jesus Really Said About Social Justice and Economics. It's a book with fascinating insights about Jesus' time on earth, starting with the story of his birth. Uh, Jerry, great to have you back with us. Always great to be with you, my friend. Jerry, I want to clear something up first by talking about the economics of the Christmas story. Uh, we're not de-spiritualizing this, are we? No, we're not. Uh, what what we might be doing is de-hyper-spiritualizing it, hmm. um, in the sense that sometimes some people in the Christian community get the idea that the Bible is only about quote unquote religious topics. And religious topics are whatever I deem are you know proper religious topics, um, but the Bible talks about whatever it talks about, right? The Holy Spirit decided what's going to be in the Bible, <laughs> um, and a lot of what's in the Bible is about things that um, aren't necessarily part of our typical Christian conversation, including yeah. things like politics and yes, economics. There's a lot of economics in the Bible, and I don't just mean anyone who listens to your show knows, of course, that the Bible talks a lot about greed. It talks about how money can be a master, etc about our heart attitude towards wealth. But I'm saying the Bible also talks a lot about economic systems. Um, but because we're not necessarily super familiar with the historical context, we don't necessarily see those things easily. So we have to kind of go do extra research and get the historical context. And then we see a whole new dimension open up in a lot of these gospel accounts, starting from the very beginning with the nativity. Well, uh, let's start at the uh, section in your book that comes from the beginning, and this is something that no one really ever thinks about, and that is the economic philosophy of the Virgin Mary. Uh, who knew she even had one? Uh, what can you tell us about it? Well, she talks about the rich being sent away empty. She talks about the proud from their thrones being deposed. Um, she talks about the poor and the hungry being filled. There's actually a lot of economics in that little poem song uh, that she sings that's known to history as the Magnificat. The reason it's called the Magnificat is because for most of church history, we only had Latin Bibles. And so the beginning, the first word in that little song is Magnificat, which is doth magnify. So when she says, my soul doth magnify the Lord, that word is Magnificat in the Vulgate, which is the Latin Bible. But it's not just religion. In fact, great portions of it are about powerful people who are exploiting the poor and how they'll be sent away empty. And what's interesting about that is that doesn't occur until she goes to be with Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth is of higher economic and social status than Mary. Mary is from Nazareth. Uh, which is a small town, not a poor town, but it's not a high status town. Um, and her cousin, Elizabeth, her husband is of sufficiently high status that he's part of one of the people who offers incense during the temple, you know, when, when his turn comes around. So they're in Judea, they're in a higher, higher status situation. So when the angel makes the announcement to Mary, she doesn't really talk much about how the social status and social classes are, are mentioned. Um, she just says, let it be you know, unto me as the Lord has said, you know, I'll, I'll do God's will. But when she travels down into Judea, the capital region, and then her higher status, higher wealth cousin says, 
you know, it, that, that the mother of my Lord should come to me, there's a reversal going on there. And then after that, Mary, most people consider it a song or maybe it's a poem, um, talks about these economic themes, that something about the coming of the Messiah isn't just about forgiving our sins and the rest of it, but it is also about calling out an economic system which was exploitative, which Jesus, as you know from the book, deals with a lot furthermore in the Gospels. And then later, when Jesus gives the Sermon on the Plain, there's the Sermon on the Mount, and then there's the Sermon on the Plain, he literally quotes his own mother twice in that sermon, making similar comments about the rich being sent away empty and the poor being filled. Interesting. Well, there's a lot more for us to unpack in terms of the background of the Christmas story and specifically the economics behind it. We're back with Jerry Boyer just around the corner. Stay with us. Do you ever feel stressed or anxious about money? If so, that's normal. But you don't have to accept that. You can find peace of mind and financial security. Learn how with the 31-day devotional, Money Seeking God's Wisdom. You'll find powerful scripture and practical exercises for spiritual and financial growth. You can request your copy with a gift of any amount. Would you consider a monthly or one-time gift by December 31st? Just visit moneywise.org slash give. We are grateful for support from One Ascent Investments on the MoneyWise program. They manage a comprehensive suite of value-based investment strategies designed to help Christian investors live aligned with what they value most. One Ascent believes that if your values inspire the way you live, they should also inspire the way you invest. This can be a unique form of worship. More information is available at investments.oneascent.com. That web address is investments.oneascent.com. Delighted to have you with us on MoneyWise. Joining me today, Jerry Boyer, the author of The Maker versus The Takers, What Jesus Really Said About Social Justice and Economics, today with some fascinating insights about the birth of Christ and the economics behind it that really helps to inform the story. And uh, Jerry, you were just sharing before the break about the economics related to the Virgin Mary and even what was going on when she travels to visit with her cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth, uh, you write, Jerry, that the nativity narrative in Luke 2, though, begins with a description of economic exploitation. Uh, how so? Caesar Augustus decided that the whole world would be taxed in some translations of the Bible or enrolled, and enrolled is for the purpose of taxation. Um, so this is a tax which is imposed on the Holy Family and on everybody. Uh, and by the way, the world there doesn't mean the whole world. He wasn't taxing people in Japan. Uh, the Greek word there is kind of the known world, the Roman world. Uh, so he decides that uh, people need to be taxed, and so they have to go on long journeys. Uh, and for a young family like uh, Joseph and Mary, that would have been quite difficult, even though the evidence is that Nazareth was a pretty solidly middle-class uh, town. Nevertheless, going on a long journey like that, in which he couldn't leave Mary at home, not because the law said she had to go, but because she, her life would have been in danger because it was likely believed that she had committed adultery. Uh, he has to take her on that long trip while she's pregnant. And then there, you know, there's a tax as part of it. So they were economically exploited, which explains why she gives the, um, as the temple sacrifice, she gives the dove you know, rather than a lamb, because that's yeah. the sacrifice for the poor. So it starts with the economic exploitation. Even before she gets to Bethlehem, there's already a lot of economics going on. Yes. Well, let's continue on that. What else can we learn about the financial condition of Joseph and Mary, Jerry? Well, we know from history that as a skilled, as a tecton, we say carpenter, but it's really skilled laborer, that this is a pretty entrepreneurial profession. So they probably weren't poor. Um, and I think it was believed for a long time until they did biblical archaeology that these would have been very poor families and that Jesus might have been leading some kind of peasant revolt. Um, I have a lot of neighbors who do things like construction and drywall and everything. They make a good living, and it's pretty likely that uh, Joseph did as well. And Jesus would have up until he got out of that business and went into the business of being a traveling rabbi. Uh, but again, if they're economically exploited and they have to make this trip, that puts them in a, in a, in a difficult position. Um, and then they go to Bethlehem, 
And there are all sorts of economic implications to the village of Bethlehem that, um, you know, aren't really well known by many Christians that I think are really important. I think they are, and they really underscore God's grand story and design before the foundations of the earth. So let's unpack that. What were the economics of Bethlehem, and how do they really uh, bring to light uh, the story of Jesus' birth? Well, one thing to remember is every time that we read about a city in the Bible, uh, any place in the Bible, and certainly in the Gospels, that city has an economy. Um, and people, I'm in Pittsburgh right now, and people associate Pittsburgh with steel, and they associate, you know, Hollywood with movies, right? And Silicon Valley with technology. Yeah. But we don't know Bethsaida, Capernaum, Nazareth. You know, that's not part of our, those would have to be footnotes for us, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and Bethlehem. Uh, so, When I think of Bethlehem, I can tell you, I just think of Christmas cookies. But they didn't think of Christmas cookies (laughs) because this is the first Christmas. Um, Actually, Bethlehem was more associated with famine, we see in the story of Ruth. Um, So, But what was the underlying economy of Bethlehem? Well, if you read the accounts, you're going to see shepherds. So that's a clue. Hey, there's shepherding involved. This is a sheep town to some degree. You don't see any other industry being mentioned. By the way, the inn is probably a guest room, not a separate hotel. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have a sheep town, but it's deeper than that. Um, This was the place, according to the Mishnah, these are the Jewish writers later on that century, this is the place set aside for shepherds. The, the rabbis didn't really trust shepherds because maybe sheep would go onto somebody else's property and eat the grass. So mm. therefore, there's, there's theft involved. So shepherding was a disreputable profession. But they have a temple system, and you need sheep for the temple, for the sacrifices. So there was a place set aside for the bearing and breeding of sheep that, that would then be inspected and sent to Jerusalem to be part of the sacrificial system. Um, when Jesus, with the money changers, he's driving out sheep, those sheep would have come from Bethlehem. Yeah. So the Lamb of God, who's, who comes into the world, who's born into the world to bear the, away the sins of the world, was born in the city that was set aside specifically for the purpose of bearing and raising sheep that were sent to the temple to bear the sins of the world in the sacrificial system. Mm. And Jerry, how did the birth of Jesus then threaten the ruling temple class in Jerusalem? The, well, the, the the issue was that the temple had become very, very corrupt, and Jesus was pointing out the corruption of the temple. Yeah. Um, and so you know, what happened is they had unjust weights and measures, inflation, basically. Mm-hmm. The temple um, had double the price of everything because they their, essentially their change-making system was corrupt. So part of what Jesus was doing in the Gospels was exposing the corruption of that. Yeah. Now, look, he wasn't mainly a social reformer. I understand that. He's the savior of the world. Um, but he is prophet, priest, and king, right? And we talk about him as priest offering himself as a sacrifice, and we talk about him as king probably not, you know, as much as we should, but he's also prophets, and prophets denounced all evil, individual evil and social evil. Mm. So if Amos is going to talk about it, Jesus is not less than Amos. So Jesus was exposing the swindle that was involved with the temple system. And he did that in his confrontations, for example, with the money changers. So I think at some level, modern Christians see Jesus coming into the world in the gospel accounts, and they think he's just going to change religion, and he's not going to have any, anything to say about economics. Herod, in some sense, understood him better than we do, because Herod knew that he was going to mess with everything. He, there was no aspect of human life that Jesus was not going to turn over. He's going to turn over sin. He's going to turn over the stones under which our sins are hidden. He's going to, you know, reverse that. He's going to take away the sins of those who ask for their sins to be forgiven. But he's also going to turn over the tables. And Herod understood that it was a corrupt system. And it said, by the way, when they heard the rumor, Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem with him Hmm. when they heard these rumors, because Jerusalem knew the basis of the economic system would not be able to go unexposed if the actual just Messiah came into the world. So he's there and he's going to bring justice, not just religious feelings and not just a different afterlife, but justice in every area of life. Herod saw that. He was on the wrong side of it. Herod didn't want justice. But Herod understood the implications that the Messiah is not just going to be, quote-unquote, 
religious. He was going to talk about economic issues as well. And Herod was a deeply corrupt man, and he was exposed by this. Mm. Jerry, just 30 seconds left. I mean, the big idea here is that understanding the economic backdrop can really help to illuminate the story that we read in the Gospels. Isn't that right? Yeah, and it, and and to me, this is a similar thing, which is, you know, I'm a father, right? You're a father. You yeah. love your kids. Yeah. Do you want their sins forgiven? Do you care about that? Yes, you do. Do you care that they're right with God? Yes, you do. Do you care if they're hungry and if, or somebody's stealing from them? You care about that too, yes. right? And you care if they don't have a home or health care. God is our Father, and He doesn't care less than, than, than we do. He cares about everything. Yes, the main thing is sins forgiven, life forever with Him, and being in the resurrection. But that's not all He cares about, that's not all He addresses, and that's not all that the kingdom of God is about. Fascinating. Jerry, thanks for stopping by, my friend. My pleasure. That's Jerry Boyer, our resident economist and the author of The Maker Versus the Takers, what Jesus really said about social justice and economics. Your calls on any financial topic are next, 800-525-7000. We'll be right back. Siri, I need some advice. What's up? I have questions about planning for retirement, long-term care insurance. I don't know where to start. It sounds like you need the MoneyWise app. It's a free app that will help you find those answers and more. Really? Sure thing. You can ask your questions within the app and access helpful articles and MoneyWise podcasts. Sounds great. Siri, download the MoneyWise app. Okay. Searching for MoneyWise on the App Store. Learn more at app.moneywise.org. My name is Kent, and I'm a member of Christian Healthcare Ministries. I have a friend who actually has great insurance, and she recently had a a life-threatening experience, and she was laying in the hospital bed afraid, not afraid for her life, but afraid of what her insurance would or would not cover. And as a CHM member, I can honestly say I just never have that fear. I can't tell you the, the peace of mind that provides. Learn more about Christian Healthcare Ministries' biblical cost sharing at chministries.org. Welcome back to Money Wise. I'm Rob West, your host. We're going to turn the corner and take your questions on anything financial. We've got some lines open, perhaps one just for you. What have you been wrestling with, thinking about? Maybe it's a financial conundrum you're stuck with. The number to call is 800-525-7000. That's 800 800- Five two five seven thousand is the number to call. Before we head to the phones, uh, this week we're sharing some of the things we hear every day from listeners like you as you apply these timeless principles. Uh, one listener wrote to us just last week and said, I love the radio program. You're helping me save more and spend less. I'm grateful for your biblical approach to financial health. It is so needed. Valerie in Georgia said, uh, MoneyWise has taught me well over the years, and I'm working toward being financially free. Thank you for what you're doing. And Greg in Tennessee specifically wrote about the app. He said, the app has revolutionized the way I manage the Lord's finances. Glory to God, and thanks for all you guys are doing. Well, do you have a testimony about God's faithfulness, and would you like to help us teach and train others? If so, we would invite you between now and December 31st to make a gift to MoneyWise Media. We do what we do because of your generous financial support. So if you're a part of the MoneyWise family, perhaps this broadcast has been an encouragement to you as you handle God's money. We just invite you to consider becoming a financial partner. It's easy. Just head to moneywise.org and click the Give button. And now uh, through December 31st is a critical time for us to meet our ministry goals from listener support so we can not only finish the year strong, but also plan for our next year of ministry together. Again, moneywise.org. Just click Give and thanks in advance. All right, let's head to the phones. 800-525-7000 is the number to call. Let's uh, head to Chicago. Hey, Kimberly, thanks for calling. Go right ahead. Hi, thank you so much for taking my call. I am wondering about a situation that might be unique. I've got a mother-in-law that lives with us, and uh, she is in hospice, and we're wondering if we should move the funds a portion of her funds to fixed annuities, if that makes sense right now. Hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, you certainly could. I think the downside is you're locking up the money, and it sounds like, you know, if she's in hospice, uh, you know, the Lord certainly could heal her. He could take her home, but it sounds like, you know, um, the the time frame on that you know, may be somewhat compressed. And with the annuity product, you know, there's a lot of fees and commissions up front. Uh, and we're going to lock up the money temporarily, whereas you may need to be able to or or may need to uh, get access to it. So I think from that standpoint, you've just got to decide, you know, what is available, how does it need to be used, and in what time frame, and then allow the investment strategy, uh, you know, to come out of that so that you have access to the funds when you need them, you have the safety you're looking for, but also the ability to grow it because you're losing purchasing power with any of these assets in, in light of inflation. So given that, what are your thoughts? I just think the short-term risk is going to return a short-term benefit in this case because we are looking at someone who's in the hospice. And I think, yeah. as you know, um, in order to – you can't keep growing the funds. They have to be canceled and reopened by those that are inheriting them. That's right. Yeah, exactly right. Um, you know, so that would be something to look into. All annuities aren't created equal, so I would make sure you get a – competent professional to help you navigate what you'd be looking at. But that's certainly a way to offset the risk, make sure you have a guaranteed return, uh, you know, for the period of time we're talking about. But you just want to make sure that the cost to go into it justifies the return you're going to get based on uh, what you're expecting, you know, given her health situation right now. If you need an advisor, you can find a CKA on our website. But I think you're on the right track here, Kimberly. Uh, Renee in Florida, you'll be next on the program. Go right ahead. How can I help you? Next year, I would like to get a um, a car because I'm gonna get I'm gonna be able to reinstate my license, and uh, I want to know how can I get have good credit because I never check my credit score, and I know I have some probably debt, you know, like with the debt collectors. I don't know if that would affect me, and uh, yeah. I would like to know how can I get started to build up my credit and pay anything that I owe. That's yeah, okay very me. good. Well, I love this question, Renee, because no matter what mistakes you've made in the past, and we all certainly have plenty of them in a host of areas, including this area of finance, I think the key is recognizing that God owns it all and you're his steward or money manager. And the uh, the task that you have is now being found faithful with what passes through your hands. And that means managing what you have wisely, living within your means, and to the extent you have previous obligations that you've not fulfilled, let's figure out what those are. Let's get the an accurate listing of not only uh, what the balances are, but making sure we understand who we owe. And then let's make a plan within God's provision to begin to not only continue to, you know, cover your own expenses, but also hopefully over time begin to pay these back. And the good news is as you apply biblical wisdom to your financial advice or, or your financial decisions, I should say, and begin to make progress, your credit score will actually begin to repair itself. And then you need to go back to your budget and really figure out how can you cut back and get a workable budget that allows you to live within your income and ideally have some margin or some excess, something left over at the end of the month after the bills are paid and you know the food's been purchased and everything else um, so that you can begin to make some progress toward these debts. And it may involve contacting each of these creditors to uh, work out a repayment plan. In some cases, you may be able to just go in and settle them with a, a single payment um, at a very deep discount. A lot of times they will, you know, give you 50 cents on the dollar if you're willing to pay it off right now. And then the key will be to start making all of your payments on time. And that includes rent and utilities. Um, I think those are really probably your next steps. Get that credit report, make a list of the debts, work on your budget, cut back, try to free up margin, start to work on establishing repayment plans with each of the creditors that you owe, and then open that secured card with one small budgeted uh, recurring charge that you pay in full every month to get that positive credit history going. And I think between all of that, you'll be uh, on your way to getting that credit score up and 
be able to uh, perhaps purchase that car in no time. Thanks for your call. Uh, That's going to do it for this edition of the program. We have covered a lot of ground, it seems, and that's always the goal. My thanks to our amazing team today, including Deb Solomon, Amy Rios, Jim Henry, and Gabby T. I'm Rob West. I'll be back again next time and hope you will too for the next edition of Money Wise. Money Wise is provided by Money Wise Media and listeners like you.